Matthew chapter 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days, in the days of Herod the king, that tells us the timing, that's really important. In the days of Herod the king, behold, behold, wise men. Now, in the Hebrew, that, of course, is magi. It's where we get the word magician from today. But magi, wise men, came from the east. It actually means they came from the rising of the sun. They came from the east. The rising of the east, that's where they came from. Prophetically, we can see it happening today, actually, with God moving upon many Muslims. Wise men are coming to Jesus, even today. And they come... And they ask, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? <laughs> We've seen his star. His star. Very important. And we have come to worship him. And it says, not only was Herod troubled, but actually all of Jerusalem was troubled with him. So who were these wise men? Well, I'm sure most of you have got some kind of an idea that they came from Persia. They came from Mesopotamia. They, as we'll look at a little bit this morning, they were trained by the greatest of all Magi. He wasn't part of the Magi, but he was certainly over them all. His name was Daniel. Daniel trained them. He trained them in the Word of God. What were they... Now let me explain something to you this morning. This is very important. We're going to be looking at the star of Bethlehem. It's something that people are always asking about. And it's something that you can use as a witnessing tool. The star of Bethlehem. Let's get one thing straight, straight away. Astrology is wrong. Does everybody know that? In fact, there was a death sentence in the Old Testament upon people that did astrology. Why is astrology so wrong? It's wrong because it's man-centred, right? That's why. It's all about self. What do my stars say? Oh, they say I'm going to meet this lovely, handsome fella, and all that. It's, the star, it's all about us. It's man-centredness. That's what astrology is. Biblical astronomy is God-centred. Have you got that? Biblical astronomy centres upon the Jewish Messiah. That's what it does. It's totally different to astrology. So back in the day, there was something called the Jewish Mazareth, which foretold the story of the Gospel in the heavens, which we'll look at a little bit this morning. But the devil always takes a truth and he makes a counterfeit. And so Satan made the counterfeit. The real thing pointed to the Messiah. The counterfeit pointed to you and I. It's what the devil did in Genesis. He said, listen, you can be like God. You don't have to worship him and centre your life on him. You can centre your life upon yourself. Astrology is all about self. Biblical astronomy is all about the Jewish Messiah. We live in a world today where, as it says in Timothy, people want their ears tickling. The best way to tickle somebody's ears is to tell them all about themselves. Coochie, coochie, woochie. Hey, you're going to be great. You. And it's big today. It's big in the church today. And people don't even know it. They're oblivious to how big it is. Um, I was at a function on Saturday night, not that long ago, standing next to a pastor, and I asked him, what are you preaching on tomorrow? He had a mild panic attack, he couldn't remember what he was preaching on. <laughs> it was quite funny, actually, and he said, uh, no, you've asked me, I just can't think. And then he said, oh, wait a minute, that's it. He says, um, we're all leaders, and because we're all leaders, we should all be leading somebody to Jesus. <laughs> Is that it? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. So that was his sermon on Sunday morning. We are all leaders, and because we're all leaders, we should all be leading somebody to Jesus. You see, folks, we are living in a day where it's all about us. 
But actually, if you look at the New Testament, we're all servants. We've all been called to serve and to prefer one another. But we're living in a day and age, it's just like astrology, where unless it's centred upon me, I'm not interested. Well, this morning, this sermon is not centred upon you. So if you like, you can fall asleep now. It's centred upon the Jewish Messiah. We know him as Yeshua, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to be looking at Jesus this morning. Who were these wise men, these magi? They had such influence in Mesopotamia. They were known as the king makers. They were right at the top of the courts. They were almost on an equal with the king. And when they turned up, a bit like Samuel turning up in Bethlehem to anoint David, when they turned up, they were the king makers. They made it happen. And there had been quite a lot of wars between the Parthians and Judea and the Romans around about this time. And when this great convoy of Magi appeared and came into Jerusalem, you can imagine what uh, Herod and his party were thinking. These are the kingmakers. These are the guys that make things happen. Not only that, but the Roman Empire had given Herod the title, the King of the Jews. That was his title. The Magi come along and say, where is the King of the Jews? Where's the one that's just been born? It was a very calculated risk from the Magi, but they didn't care because they were the dudes of the East. They were utterly fearless and they were coming to say, there's a new king on the block. And we've come, we've seen his star and we've come to worship him. And the Bible says, Herod, whose title was the king of the Jews, was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Why all Jerusalem? Because we just don't like change. And we'd rather have the devil that we know than some other kind of change. None of us like change, but change is here to stay, isn't it? Change is the one thing you can guarantee is going to happen in your life. Change. Okay, that's some of the background. Now let's, let's just take away some things that the star couldn't have been first this morning. The, the star certainly was not a shooting star. Has anybody ever seen a shooting star? Ever? Uh, the last Fishers of Men meeting I went to was in Burslem. Uh, Phil Weaver was ministering. I don't know if you remember, but we left that and the greatest shooting star I have ever seen went shoot. It, was, it looked like a plane was coming out of the sky to crash. It was seen all over the Northern Hemisphere. It was absolutely enormous and it crashed in Russia. And as we, as we were coming out of Burslem, it was almost like it was over Burslem. Even though it crashed in Russia, it looked like it was over Burslem. And it went flying through the sky with such ferocity. Could not have been a shooting star. Shooting stars move and they don't last more than seconds. Number two, it certainly was not a comet. Because comets, all the way through the ages, have spoke of omens, bad omens. If you look through the ages, whenever there was a comet, everybody knew about it. Not just the Magi, everybody knew that a comet meant doom. So it, it wasn't a comet. It wasn't a supernova, I'll explain why a su supernova is a star exploding. It wasn't a supernova because of its peculiarities when it came to Bethlehem. And I am unsure as to whether it was the glory of God, the Shekinah. And the reason why I say that is because every time the glory of God is mentioned in the scripture, it's mentioned as the glory of God. It's mentioned as the Shekinah. But in this, these professional guys who knew how to interpret the signs of the times, they knew it was his star. Now let me just say before we go any further, we live in a day and age of the, the most breathtaking sci-fi films, don't we? The, the new Star Wars film is coming out in a few days' time. We're so used to jaw-dropping special effects today that quite frankly, if we'd have seen the star back then, we'd have never looked at it twice. Because unless you understand how to interpret the signs of the times, 
the seasons and so on, it wouldn't have made any sense. That's why Jerusalem didn't see it, that's why Herod didn't see it, and that's why the Magi did see it. Because you have to have an eye to see. You have to be seeking, and you have to be trained in that way to see. And these men were the very first Christian pilgrims. Determined to see, not only to see, but to worship the new king. They were the king makers. And of course, next week we'll look at the gifts, the prophetic gifts that they came with. But their journey from Mesopotamia right the way over to Israel would have been thwart with difficulties and it would have taken months and months as they went on that convoy. But nothing stopped them, not to come and see the star, but to come and see the one whom the star represented, the king of the Jews. Praise the Lord. If you want to turn this morning, we'll start at Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. God is trying to describe himself. And he says in Isaiah 40, To whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall be equal, says the Holy One. So, he goes on to talk about the stars, and he says here that not only has he made all the stars, and this is so important, folks, but he's also given them all names. God has named every single star, right? Now, I know you know this, but I have to say it again. Hubble, the telescope, which is outside of the atmosphere in this last 20, 30 years, has shown us that the universe is far bigger than we ever thought, ever dreamt it was going to be. So, um, there's over 100 billion galaxies, right? And in each one of those 100 billion galaxies, there's between, this is an average, between 100 and 200 billion stars. And around those stars, there'll be planets and all sorts of things. The universe is absolutely massive, but how do we know it's massive? How do we know? How do we know that actually the universe isn't quite small? In perspective to what is the universe massive? Let me give you, let me try and explain it to you. You have 100 trillion, not billion, you have 100 trillion cells in your body. Are you big? Would you consider yourself to be massive? Would you consider yourself to be quite small? In what perspective are you big or small? There's 100 trillion cells in your body and in each one of those cells there are trillions of particles. So in what sense are you big or small? The universe is, is beyond comprehension but in what sense is it big or small? To God, it's not the way that we see it. To God, it's a simple matter to create the universe. Big or small doesn't come into it. It's God. To whom shall you liken me? To whom shall you liken me, or whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high. It's something that we don't do enough of, folks. We spend so much time on social media. We spend so much time listening to the radio or television or this thing or that thing. We hardly ever go outside on a dark night and look at the stars. And yet the Bible tells us in so many places, lift your eyes and look. It says, lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host in number and he calls them by name. It says again in Psalm 147 that he calls them by name. Now the key, if you're interested, <laughs> the key to understanding constellations is to, is to interpret them in terms of their luminosity. So the brightest star is the key. They all have names, right? They all have names. So you look for the brightest star and you look at that name. And by the way, the names of the stars are the same in every single culture. It might be a different spelling, but the meaning of the name is the same in every single culture. So you look to a constellation, I'll give you an example, Leo, it wouldn't have been called Leo, 
under the Jewish Mazareth, but it certainly means lion, okay, lion. And this, uh, the, the star of the greatest magnitude in lion, Leo, is Regulus, Regulus. So Leo means lion, it, it's the king constellation. Regulus is called the king star, okay? The wise men, the magi, knew these things. They were looking for these things all the time. Let me explain to you how it works. Um, you've probably noticed that there are lights and the, the cross on the front of the church now come on automatically. Well, that's because there's a timer up in the loft. So what happens is, there's a couple of notches, you, you, we've all seen these timers, where you pull the notch out in a couple of places, it means as the clock goes round like that, when it hits that notch, the lights come on. Whereas the clock goes round to there, when it hits that notch, the lights go off. The entire universe is the most complex, wound up clock that has specific times for specific things to happen. The birth of Christ, the massacre of the innocent, the end time, the tribulation, all the way through history, it's one massive wound up clock that knows exactly when everything's going to happen and when such and such a person is going to get born again and, and come into the kingdom of God. Everything is predetermined and yet you and I must cooperate with God. It's a mystery. Job chapter 38 is an amazing chapter and it gives us real insight into the Magi and the stars. This is God speaking. Possibly the oldest book in the Bible, Job. And this is what it says. It's now talking not just about stars, but about constellations. That's groups of stars. And God asks, rhetorical question can you bind the cluster of Pleiades we now know today that Pleiades is gravitationally bound together we know that they didn't know that back then but we know today that they are gravitationally bound together Has anybody seen Pleiades anybody seen Pleiades so you look into the night sky and you see Orion does everybody know what Orion looks like it's a massive constant it's about that big in the night sky as you look it's huge there's Orion, if you look to the right over there, you'll see seven stars, seven t you can just make them out with your eye, seven stars, people link Pleiades to the seven churches, the seven lampstands, and he asked the question, can you bind them? Well, we didn't know, we've only just found out in the last 10, 20 years that they are bound together. Then he asked the question, can you loose the belt of Orion? Now, Orion has a belt, and then there's a dagger going down like that. Has any, anybody, do you know what the belt of Orion looks like, right? Well, the belt of Orion is flying apart at a huge rate. It's loosed. It looks in the sky like they're all bound together, but they're not. They're loose. They're flying apart at huge rates. God asked the question, can you bind Pleiades? He's actually bound them. And he asked the question, can you loose the belt of Orion? It looks to us as though they're all gravitationally bound, but they're not. They're flying apart at huge rates. God knows, folks. He knows stuff that we don't know, surprisingly enough. Can you loose the belt of Orion? But this is the important part. He says, can you bring out the Mazareth in its season? The Mazareth. This is that which was there before the Zodiac. It is a gospel story in the stars. It is the heavens telling the glory of God. It begins with the virgin conceiving, Virgo, and it goes all the way along like this until it gets to the lion, Leo, the lion of the tribe of Judah. The very constellations from creation have told out the gospel story of the Messiah. The problem is, it's not about me or you. And that's why we get bored and we switch off. It's actually about him. And you have to be of a certain maturity that you want to look at him and love him and not necessarily get anything out of it for yourself. Remember, astrology is man-centered. Biblical astronomy is messiah-centered. So 
God asks these questions. He says, I've put these things up there and they all mean something. Have a look at Psalm 19, just a few pages across. Psalm 19. This is the big one. This is the one that tells us everything about the stars. Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare. The heavens are declaring the glory of God. The skies show. So they, de they declare and they show God's handiwork. Day after day, they utter speech. So they declare and they show and they speak. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. So they declare, they show and they speak knowledge. And their language, there's no speech. This is amazing because it's true. Today it's true. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. In every culture, these stars mean the same thing. Their line has gone out throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the earth. And by the way, just to cap it all off, Paul in Romans chapter 10 says that people are without excuse because before the gospel ever came, it was preached through the stars. He actually says that in Romans chapter 10, verses 17 to 18. It was preached through the stars, so that they were without excuse. It was perverted at the Tower of Babel. Before the Tower of Babel, they understood the Mazareth. After the Tower of Babel, it went to Zoroastrianism, it went to the Zodiac. The problem, friends, with us is sometimes we'll say, don't touch that with a barge pole, when actually behind that thing, God had something there that the devil has perverted. What I've re recognised is that since the last time I looked at this, there are many, many scholars now understanding that actually one of the signs of the times is up there and Jesus told them, you, you, you're foolish, you're so slow to understand the signs of the times. The problem is, folks, we're looking for Bruce Willis's Armageddon. We're looking for great big special effects and that's not how God works. You have to understand the symbology of the constellations to understand the star that the Magi were looking for. Come on, it was a gospel message last week. It was nice and simple. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 39 is such an interesting little... Um, quirky thing Jeremiah 39 verse 3 uh, um, Israel uh, Jerusalem have been captured by the Babylonians then all the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat at the middle gate and Nurgle Sharezar was the first one that was mentioned Probably not pronounced his name right. <laughs> Let's just call him Shaz. <laughs> Shaz just so happened to be the kingmaker. He was the chief of the Magi. Did you get that? When Israel was captured, when Jerusalem was captured, and the officials sat in the gate, the first name that was mentioned was the chief of the Magi. That's how much influence they had in Babylon. And when God, through a sequence of events with Daniel, made Daniel the head of the Magi, he knew what he was doing, didn't he? <laughs> he knew what he was doing. Let's just have a little look at that. Daniel chapter 2, verse 48. Daniel 2, 48. Remember Nebuchadnezzar had a dream? Well, the Magi were skilled in interpreting dreams. They had books on it. It's, you can interpret dreams, folks. It's part of a, a spiritual gift to do that. It tells us in Acts chapter 2 that, the, that there'll be dreams and visions and so on and so forth. Well, the Magi were skilled in interpreting dreams. 
But of course, Nebuchadnezzar knew that they were skilled in interpreting dreams, so he said to them, I'm not even going to tell you the dream. You need to tell me the dream and then give me the interpretation. Remember that? I mean, that's insane. Daniel calls a fast. You would call a fast. If your head was about to be taken off your head because the king is saying, I don't just want some flaky interpretation. We can all do that. But I want the dream first. I'm not even telling you the dream. And of course, Daniel went to prayer. And God, our God, our faithful God, came through for Daniel and he'll come through for you. And the, the dream and the interpretation was given to King Nebuchadnezzar. Get this, folks. Get how important this is. The first official that's mentioned at the conquering of Jerusalem was the chief of the Magi. And now Nebuchadnezzar is saying, you're going to be chief over all the Magi. There was no greater honour, folks. You're going to be chief over the king makers. This is what it says here. Daniel 2.48 Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the magi, over all the wise men. Pretty amazing, isn't it? So now... God has his man in power of the most powerful men on planet Earth, the Magi. Now Daniel was a mystic in the sense that God spoke to him in riddles and dreams and visions, didn't he? And the Magi would have loved it. They would have loved Daniel. He would have been amazing to them. Because now they've got a man who really and truly uh, was uh, the representative of the one true God. They loved the dreams and riddles and all that kind of stuff, but now they've got a purpose. They already were monotheistic, by the way. The Magi were monotheistic. They only believed in one God. And now Daniel is telling them who that God is. And they have to admit, we couldn't do it. We couldn't do what you did. Of course, later on, in the, under the next empire, he's chucked into the lion's den, isn't he? Same thing happens again. He, <laughs> he's chief all over. Same thing happened with Joseph. Didn't it? Same thing happened with Joseph. So sometimes, folks, when we, um, we think it, it's not going to come good for us, it, it will eventually. Hold on in there. God was with Joseph. God is with you. Now let's have a look at what Daniel, the great revelations that the angel Gabriel gave to Daniel. The next time we see the angel Gabriel is when he's telling Miriam, Mary, that she's going to have a child even though she's a virgin. Well, the angel Gabriel came to Daniel. And this is what he says to him, Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. We're not going into detail, but this is very important because the Magi that came to see the Messiah would have known these things. They would have been taught these things by Daniel. Daniel 9, uh, 24. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Now, I'm not going to go into detail here, but these 70 weeks, a week means sevens. It actually speaks 70 times seven. It's 490 minus the seven years of the tribulation period is 483 years. The 483 years began at 45 445 BC when Artaxerxes gave the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem and it was fulfilled in AD 32. They knew that somewhere around AD 32 the Messiah would be put to death. That was taught them, they knew that. That's part of what they knew. Now let's look at the scripture that they didn't know that they found out when they got to Jerusalem. Micah chapter 5 verse 2. God always confirms his word, folks, always. So when you're on the right track, when you're doing the right thing, sometimes it requires a step of faith, but along the way, God will confirm his word correctly to you. And uh, here, when they got to Jerusalem, the, the, the word that was given to them was confirmed through Micah 5.2. Remember, they asked, who, who, where is this guy who's going to be born king of the Jews? 
The scribes, Herod asked the scribes, well, what's the, what's, what's the crack here? And they said, well, actually, it tells you in Micah 5, verse 2, that he's going to be born in Bethlehem, same place that David was born. But this is very important from the point of view of the Magi. It will become clear. I hope it will. It might not. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah. So, coming back to the Nazareth, there is a constellation given over to Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And it starts off by saying that in Bethlehem, in Judah, something's going to happen. And it goes on to say, yet out of you, out of Judah, will come forth the one who will be ruler over Israel, whose going forth are from old, even from everlasting. It's an amazing prophecy because it tells us that the God-man is eternal. He has no beginning and no end. And that the God-man will come out of, from the point of view of the Magi, will come out of the constellation that represents Judah, which is, we know today as Leo. It wouldn't have been called Leo, it was the lion. The lion. So something had to be in the constellation of Judah that made sense to the Magi. Are you with that? Folks, I'm telling you the truth this morning. That's how they interpreted prophecy back then. That's how they did it. It's this whole wound up clock which stops and something happens and it stops and something else happens. God knows the day you were born. He knows the day that you're going to die. He knows the number of our days. Everything God knows. Now let's look at uh, a crazy prophet. A, a real wild card called Balaam. If you want to turn to Numbers chapter 24. Balaam was a real wild card. He was, a, he, he was the wild child of the prophetic world. He couldn't be tamed. He was a bit of a nutter. And he also liked cash. So Balak wanted to curse the children of Israel. What better way than to use the great and mighty, powerful, not Oz, but Balaam. If anybody's going to be able to do it, Balaam's going to be able to do it. And Balaam's thinking, you know, whatever, if there's cash in it, I'll do it. So Balaam goes up on top of a mountain to curse the children of Israel. And the most amazing thing happens. The Spirit of God comes upon Balaam. This uncontrollable uh, loose cannon in the Bible that was totally, um, he was a chameleon. The Spirit of God comes on him so strongly that he can't help but bless the people of God. When people say God's put a curse on you, you cannot be cursed because of the cross. When you're under the shadow of the Almighty, you can't be cursed. Balaam tried to because he wanted the cash, but he couldn't because the Spirit of God arrested the man. So he's trying to, but what's coming out is just amazing prophecies about Israel. But the king of all that prophecy has to be this. Imagine him, you know, he's there. I, I, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter, that means king. A star is also a king. He's a scepter, he's the king. Shall rise out of Israel. And then he goes, he starts to go on and talk about his own people are going to be battered. Yeah, you have to be under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to speak a prophecy against your own battering. And he says it will batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of Tumult. Edom shall be a possession. And on he goes. God has got hold of the man. Instead of um, uh, speaking judgments against Israel, he's speaking judgments against his own people. And by the way, in 135 AD, during the rebellion, Edom and Moab 
Because in 135, Rome re, uh, renamed Israel Palestine and Edom and Moab were amalgamated into the Palestinians, right? This is important because this is not just a prophecy about the first coming, it's a prophecy about the second coming. And at the second coming, the trouble in Palestine will be dealt with. So not only is a star going to come out of Jacob, but God will judge the Palestinians. Some will be saved, but he will judge them. It's a mighty prophecy, and it came from a guy that wanted the opposite. That's brilliant, isn't it? That's our God, that's his sense of humour. Balaam wanted the exact opposite, and God says, you'll do as I say. Now let's get to the, virtually the final scripture. Have a look in Revelation chapter 12 for a minute. So I hope you've, you, you, you're beginning to grasp this. They were not looking for um, Bruce Willis explosions in Armageddon, the, the Magi. They weren't. You've got to get all that out of your head. They weren't looking for lightsabers and, and ray guns going through the air. Oh, a sign. Just seen a lightsaber. It, it wasn't like that. They were looking and studying the constellations that spoke of the Messiah, but they were also watching, they called them wandering stars back then, we know them now as planets. The word planet means wandering star. And when the planets came into conjunction with the constellations, it meant something. It was important. And this is what the wise, the magi saw. It's amazing because you didn't need a telescope for any of this. You could see it with just your eye. And they stood up on their watchtowers in Babylon. Um, I mean, I saw, I saw a picture the other day of Mecca. And uh, somebody, how oh, they took this picture. It's an incredible picture. They're going around the, the, the big black meteorite, by the way, in the middle of Mecca. And they kiss it. They're told not to worship anything, but they kiss it. And they're going round. You see the hordes of them going round. Somebody has taken a long exposure picture. Oh, there's Mecca. There's the, the seven towers. And there's the spiral arm of the Milky Way looking really eerie right over Mecca. Oh, they were big into all this kind of stuff. They knew how to interpret constellations and planets, wandering stars. And they knew when a conjunction happened, it was time to move. What did they know? They knew the timing because of Daniel chapter 9. They knew there was going to be a significant star because of Numbers chapter 24. When they got to Jerusalem, they also knew the very place where he was going to be born, Bethlehem. There was a little bit of faith required in this and God confirmed every bit as they went on. Revelation chapter 12 what happens in the heavens is only a, uh, a, a, an echo of what's going on on the earth. Does everybody understand that? So the sun turning dark in the last days speaks of the prophetic light of the church growing dim. The moon turning blood red speaks of persecution of the saints. What's up there only reflects what's going on down here. Revelation chapter 12. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. Notice that it's a sign. It's really important. And who saw this? John from the Isle of Patmos. What did he see? He saw a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Now, for those of you that don't know this, the constellations, they always rise in the east. And they come around like so. Leo and Virgo are the first and the last. Virgo is the first, Leo is the last. And they come up. So first of all, you've got Leo rising. And I'll sh show you what happened in Leo. But following Leo is Virgo. Coming up, the virgin. And it tells us here in Revelation chapter 12 that there was a great and marvellous sign. And exactly at the time of Christ's conception, 
Virgo arose, clothed in the sun, with the moon at her feet. Now you say to yourself, how do you know? Because of Isaac Newton and Kepler, we know the motions of the planets to the T. We know where every planet was at every point in time because it is totally predictable mathematics. And you can buy Stellarium or Starry Skies. You can go back in time and see exactly what the stars would look like from any given point on the Earth. It's, it's not rocket science. Everybody, well, it is rocket science, actually. <laughs> <coughs> So there was a sign. Virgo was clothed in the sun with the moon at her feet. But the other sign, the great sign, was Leo. And this is what they saw on September the, uh, in September, which was the, roughly the time of the conception. In 3 BC, there was a conjunction. Does everybody know what that means? When you get a conjunction... Jupiter, now you need to understand this, right? In every culture, Jupiter is the king planet, right? What happens is, every culture has their own god for Jupiter. And so Zeus and so on and so forth. They all have their own god, but that doesn't mean that Jupiter's evil. Do you understand? God created Jupiter. And so behind all those counterfeits, there's the real thing. And Jupiter speaks of the king. And it just so happened that there was a convergence coming up from the east. The wise men saw a convergence between Jupiter. Let's get this right. The very constellation, Leo, speaks of the king. The constellation speaks of the king. Jupiter was the king planet. And Regulus... The brightest star is called the King Star. And as the wise men looked from the east, they saw the King constellation with the King planet converging with the King Star. And because the two had converged and come together, it looked pretty bright in the constellation that they saw. They looked to the east and they said, we have seen his star. It's time to go. It's time to go. When they got to... Jerusalem, they saw nine months later, this is nine months later, they saw another convergence between Jupiter and Venus. Now, in uh, the book of Revelation, Jesus calls himself the bright and... Does anybody know what the morning star is? It's Venus. And if you ever see Venus, I see Venus on the milk round, it is so bright! It is, it is so bright! It's so awesome! And there was a convergence between Jupiter and Venus. They came together and it was recorded as the brightest star that ever they saw. Where was it? It was over Jerusalem. And off they went towards Jerusalem. But how do you explain the star actually stopping over Bethlehem? That's the thing that's puzzled people for ages. But they, using computer software, which is again... If you don't think it's reliable, folks, then how do you think we get all the space probes going to where they go to? Uh, we know how these things work. We understand Newton's laws of motion and so on. When they got to Jerusalem, they looked towards Bethlehem and the star had stopped over Bethlehem. What does that mean? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, we're going round, aren't we? The planet is going round like this and we're going round the sun. But from the point of view of where we are, we don't see the planets behaving in a manner that we think they'd behave in. They behave in something called uh, retromotion. And what that means is, as we go past a planet, it appears to go like this in the sky. And then it suddenly stops and goes back on itself. And it stops and goes back on itself. And by the way, when the wise man, man saw the convergence, the first convergence, they saw that happen three times. That's very, very rare. They saw a bright star, king, king, king. Over days, king, a convergence. Well, over Bethlehem, Jupiter was going this way. And then just at the point where it goes back in retromotion, it stopped. And off they went 
to Bethlehem. Now, here's the thing, folks. As Christians, we're always looking for the big voice. We're always looking for the big prophecy. And Elijah tells us sometimes God speaks in a very still, small voice. Elijah went to Horeb, that's Mount Sinai. Why was it so important that God, it said that God spoke in a still small voice? Because the last time that God spoke from there, he spoke to Moses in thunder and lightning. And it's God recording. Don't expect God to speak to you the way that he spoke to you last time. He will choose the way that he speaks. And the heavens, it tells us in Psalm 19, declare and they tell and they fill the world with knowledge. But today... We're so impatient. We're so impatient. The Magi were not impatient. They were seeking the Messiah and they found him. They were the first pilgrims. Let me finish this morning um, looking at one last scripture in Daniel chapter 12. This is Daniel speaking. He is, he is the king of the king makers, is Daniel. Now last year, Last year, 2015, you probably all remember this, right? In 2015, there were four blood-red moons that coincided with the Jewish feast. Do you remember that? And, and um, I, I believe, rightly so, people made a big deal of it because we're told to look for the signs. And they were signs. What most people uh, don't know is, let me get my date right, I think it's the 29th of June. No, it's the 30th of June. The, the 30th of June that year, the star of Bethlehem showed itself up again. The first time in 2,000 years. It showed itself up, it appeared. There was a convergence between Jupiter and Venus just uh, before the sun went down. The star of Bethlehem, for the first time in 2,000 years. Now what am I saying, folks? I'm saying this. That the signs of the times are there for a reason, but God is not in a rush. Things happen slowly, but they get there. It's like the hare and the tortoise. You've got to get used to prophecy being the tortoise. But there comes a point where events speed up, folks, and, and they get quicker and quicker. But let me read you this last part here. The, Daniel chapter 12. These are the words of Daniel. The king of the king makers... At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that time, at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Listen, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, like the stars forever and ever. Here is the promise. God said to Abraham, look Abraham, look up into the night sky. What can you see? I see thousands, billions of stars, Lord. So shall your descendants be. And those who are wise, that's talking about you and me, the church, Israel, the Messianic Jews, they represent the stars, the stars in heaven. And the Bible says, those who are wise, how do you get wisdom, folks? You get wisdom through the word of God. It tells you in Proverbs, that's how you get wise. Those who are wise shall shine like the stars in heaven. Look, Abraham, what do you see? I see stars. So shall your descendants be. And those that lead many to righteousness shall shine like the stars forever and ever. It's amazing, isn't it? There's a promise, folks, that one day you're going to shine. And this, this earth is full of stars uh, that seem to shine more than other people. When we get to heaven, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. I'm telling you, there'll be people in heaven, servants in churches that nobody really ever cared about. They will shine like the stars in heaven. I think of Gene Nicholson from Biddle, 
Pentecostal church. That woman is such a servant. She leads people to how many people did she did she bring into that church? How many people did she win for Christ? They'll shine like the stars forever and ever. Here's the thing. These magi, they cross from Mesopotamia right the way through to Jerusalem. Why? To see the Messiah. To see the Messiah. And we have to ask ourselves today, folks, what are we willing to do for Jesus? Those are the wise will shine. And those that lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. Let me finish. I've said that one or two times, but this is finished. No more scriptures. Every sign means something. It might not happen as quick as you want it to, but you take your eye off the tide and you'll be trapped. Is that not always the case? That's what you tell your kids. Keep an eye on the tide, because if you take your eye off the tide, you'll be trapped. That's how it is with prophecy. You take your eye off prophecy, things have moved. There are three things that happen when the Bethlehem star is shown. Number one, there is persecution. Persecution is coming to the church, folks. Persecution is coming to the church. Whenever you see the Bethlehem star, the innocent will get slaughtered. Persecution is coming. Number two, not only will persecution come, but war will come. War is coming. War's coming to the Middle East. War's coming to the world. The Bethlehem star the first time and the Bethlehem star the second time, war is coming. Persecution, number one, persecution. Number two, war. And number three, Jesus is coming. The sign of the Bethlehem star is Jesus Christ is coming. Amen.